I want to read my scripture this morning that is a continuation from last Sunday. I want to speak to you about a victory that doesn't make a lot of sense to us in the natural mind. And my text is found in Joshua chapter, sorry, Judges chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 to 8 once again. Early in the morning, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of meeting was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. And they'd say, my own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may, back, may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out there for you. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap with the water with their tongues as dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 and who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Lord, I thank you today. Thank you for the power that is in the Word. I thank you, Lord, that we can depend upon you. You will be the one that will speak into our lives and transform us. No man can do it. So God, I rely upon you and your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, to invigorate us, inspire us, challenge us, and take us from this place, God, knowing that we indeed have gotten God's Word for us. We ask that in your name, amen, and you may be seated. A senseless victory. I'll never forget it. It was my first church, Estrahazy, Saskatchewan. Shortly after I got there, it was probably in the springtime of the year, when I began pastoring there in 1983. A young man that was really on fire for God. He wanted to do great things for the Lord, and that was talking to him. He, he came into my office. He's all fired up for Jesus, and he said, well, I'm just visiting in your town for the next little while, and while I'm here, I, I plan to come to church this Sunday, fellowship with you. So I thought, great, great, come fellowship with us. We'll be glad to have you. And so after we chatted, he left, and then I got back to whatever I was doing, Shortly after that, he came back through my office, and he said, but Pastor, I want you to know that I plan to be here this Sunday, but if by chance the rapture happens, I will not be here. And with that, I looked a bit stunned. Well, where do you think I'll be? Now, that Sunday, I don't think he even showed up. Oh, my goodness. Maybe the rapture did happen. And if it did, you and I are in big big trouble. Another story. I was, I think it was that same summer. It was on a Saturday afternoon. A young man called me and he said, Pastor, could you come meet with me? I, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm hungry. And so my wife made a sandwich and I met him downtown. We sat in a park bench and he looked tattered, worn out, looked beat up. Not physically, but mentally, and just looked like he was in rough shape. And he said, I'm, I'm hitchhiking across Canada, going to Ontario, but he said, as I am hitchhiking, I'm telling people about Jesus. And he said, but I've been abused, I've been kicked out of cars, I've been threatened, I've been cursed at. Well, I said, what's your approach? Well, he said, as soon as I get in the car, I immediately tell them, they're going to hell. And I said, there's your problem right there. I said, why not try? I've never been much of the turn or burn theology. But I said, try a little grace. <laughs> try a little love. I know we go through a lot of persecution, but there's no sense inviting pointless persecution to come your way. There's a lot of things that we do that do not make a lot of sense. A lot of things that we say. In fact, i got to, let me... What we do makes not a lot of sense sometimes, things we do. Play-Doh and microwave should not be used in the same sentence. Strange things people do. No matter how much jello you put in a swimming pool, you still can't walk on water. Number 14 says pool filters do not 
like jello. And here's another one. Garbage bags do not make good parachutes. The strange things that people do, things that make no sense whatsoever. Marbles and gas tanks make a lot of noise when driving. I like this one, though. It says, uh, the spin cycle on the washing machine does not make earthworms dizzy. Number 22 says, it will, however, make cats dizzy. Number 23 says, cats throw up twice their body weight in, when dizzy. Why do people do those things? People do a lot of strange things that don't make a lot of sense. They do that. And then others kind of, they peer in and then they scratch their head. Yep, redneck. Well, that's a new thing now. Last week I began this series, two-part series by, by saying that not only do you and I say things and do things and people say things and do things that don't make a lot of sense, but when you read through the Bible, we discover that God does the same thing. There's a lot of things that He does that in the natural, we look at it, we peer in, we read the Bible, we read like Judges or Joshua, what is that, Judges chapter 7, we look in there and we say, God, it doesn't make sense, natural sense to my understanding, why you're choosing to do what you do. You could have chosen it another way. Why did you choose it to be that way? But God does a lot of things, he's been doing that since the book of Genesis, that does not make a lot of sense to our natural minds. And this is one of those stories. Instead of increasing the army, he is decreasing the forces. But what God does is as we read this, it's just not a nice little story that we scratch our heads over, but what God is inviting believers, God's inviting His followers, those that stand upon the Word of God, those that say, I believe, I trust, I love God, I give Him my life. He's saying, I invite you as my chosen people to take a leap, take a giant step, take a leap from the natural and jump into the supernatural. That's called miracle territory. He says, you've got to do it. Take a leap. God says there's a principle that's found in my word. It's weaved throughout every portion of the Bible. It's weaved throughout its pages, and I want my people to get it. I have a way of bringing victory to my people, which is unnatural and which is so uncommon. In fact, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says that we, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, in fact, NIV says, immeasurably, above all that we could ask, think, or envision. That's what God is able to do. It says, by the power, by His power that works through us. I can blow your minds by what I can do. So He says, take that leap of faith. Take that extra step. Launch out into the deep. To get your feet out of the boat, and you'll walk on water. Walk with me, and you'll see miracles. Well, this is a big, big leap for us. A very, very big leap for me. Because I, as you, are mired in the natural. That's all I see around me. I'm embedded in the natural. And so we become locked into the natural path, and we miss the victories that only come by the supernatural. I'm convinced there are some victories that come only by the supernatural. And many times we miss them because we're afraid to step out and launch into the deep. We're mired and held back because we're afraid to step out. And we miss them, these victories, and we continue to live in defeat. And so God says that I understand what you're going through. I understand these mean Midianites, 135,000 of them. I understand there's a problem here. And so they desperately want a victory. They desperately want to have their hands raised in triumph. And God says, okay, here's the unnatural way. Here is the uncommon way that I'm going to bring you into victory lane. The first thing he says to them is this. You've got to reduce and downsize the flesh. Last week I talked about this one point. We have to downsize the flesh. Judges chapter 7 and verse 2. He says, there's too much flesh, there's too much man, too many bodies. He says, too many men, 32,000 is too many against 135,000. We say we don't have enough, but God says there's too many, so we've got to get rid of some of them. And God tells them and tells us why flesh needed to be reduced. He said, it's because Israel, Israel might become lifted up with pride. That's the danger for man, isn't it? 
that we become too swelled-headed because Israel might be tempted to glory in themselves. They might be tempted to begin to boast in, this is the power of man. This is what I have done. This is what I have achieved. And God says, here's God's point. I want there to be no question who brought the victory. I don't want there to be any mistake made. I want you to know that I am the one that brought you to victory lane. You did not do it yourself, but I did it. And so I'm going to do something and show you something here that's going to put the exclamation mark here, that you're going to know that it's God. See, the end of man has always and has always been the beginning of God. The end of man has always been the beginning of God. And God always wants you and I to be living that way. At the end of man depleting ourselves of this flesh and saying, God, I lay this on the altar because I know that at the end of me, supernatural and marvelous things come about. First thing to remember, if you want to end up in victory lane by God's way, he may be telling you, downsize the flesh like you told them. Secondly, we start today. Secondly, God said to Gideon, he said, now, not only do you need to downsize the flesh, but you also need to upsize the faith. Upsize the faith. Judges 7 and verse 3, God says, anyone who trembles in fear may turn back and leave. So 22,000 men left. They left 10, how do you think the 10,000 felt? We're really starting to whittle this team down. 22,000 left. See, faith and fear, they don't work too well together. There needs to be a separation. A new Christian one time earnestly said, Oh, why can't God, why can't God and the devil just get along? It'd make life so much easier for all of them. Why can't they just shake hands and embrace and love each other? You know, it's never going to happen. Opposite ends of the spectrum. Opposites, it'll never happen. Fear will either mess up faith or faith will mess up fear. Either one. You can't have both. You can't have faith and fear. They don't work together. They're not teammates. They're not running in the same direction. Opposites. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. When you begin to grapple and understand and embrace the perfect love, the unblemished love that God has for His people. Not tainted. But a perfect love, that begins to cast out fear. And the Bible says, why fear needs to be cast out? Because fear has torment. Fear has torment. Fear will defeat you before you even get out of bed in the morning. Before you even move a muscle. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will drive you to hospitals and institutions. It will be the vehicle that will drive you there. Fear will cause you to become, to become addicted to drugs. I can't make it on my own. I can't function on my own. And so here, let's take some drugs to try and get rid of the fear. At some point, at some time, you're going to have to deal with it. You might as well deal with it up front. Fear will lock you out of your potential. Fear will keep you locked behind doors. Fear will keep you from accomplishing the visions and the dreams and the plans that God has for your life, fear will keep you and hold you back. Fear is a terrible, terrible, terrible taskmaster. Fear and faith and fear do not work very well together. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, faith is the, is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Faith is not natural. It's, I don't think it is. Faith is not natural. It's supernatural. It comes from God. It's seeing with our eyes closed. Someone said faith is the single most important element of the Christian life, and I believe it is. Faith is the belief with a strong conviction. Faith is a firm belief in something for which there may be no tangible proof. But faith says, I see it. I see it. I see it. It may not be visible, but I still see it. Oh, there was no tangible proof that Israel would be victorious over the Midianites. All they had was the Word of God. All they had was what God said, you do this and I'll show you. But there's no tangible proof. Just had to trust and obey. Just had to stick with the Master. Just had to do what God told them to do. See, if there's ever going to be a victory, 
There are times when you need to wave goodbye to fear and say hello to faith. Now, faith. Gary Smalley said one time that love is a decision. Love is not a feeling. Threw a lot of people for a loop at first. Oh, I thought it was touchy-feely. No. You don't feel, always feel like you're married. You get up in the morning. If you do, you're not normal. But so Gary Smalley said, love is a decision. And I believe that faith is kind of the same thing. Faith, it is a, is a decision. You get up, you discover one day, you say, I'm going to decide I'm going to have faith today. I'm not going to have doubt, but I'm going to have faith. Everything that God has told me, I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to do what he's told me to do. And once you decide, I am going to have faith, the rest will come in line. Once you decide you're going to love, once you decide you're going to stay in your marriage, once you decide this is it, other things have to line up. And faith is like that. I am going to have faith. I'm going to wave goodbye to doubt and fear. And so that's the second thing God said to these, these men. Get in in your army that I'm working with and downsizing. Upsize the faith. Third thing he says is, Endure some testing. God says that you're going to endure some testing. Judges chapter 7 and verse 4, God says there's still too many men. So I want you to take them down to the water, and there he says, I'm going to thin them out. Well, thinning is not what a lot of them had in mind at this point in time. God, how far down are you going to take this group? Now the word thin or sift in the Hebrew means to prove. It means to purge. It means to refine. It means to melt. It means to purify. It's the same Hebrew word used in Psalm 26 and verse 2 where David said these words. He said, God, I want you to test me. I want you to try me. I want you to examine me and examine my heart and examine my mind. It's in this particular verse of Scripture, chapter in Psalm 26 that Paul or that David says these words. He says, I am mindful, God, of you. He says, I have lived relying on your faithfulness. He says also to God, I don't associate or do what the wicked do. There's a division here. I don't do those things. He says, I praise you in word and song. I know what it's like to love the house of God. I know what it's like to come to church and raise my hands. and say, God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I worship you. And he said, I praise you. He said, I tell others about you. And he says, I lead a blameless life. My feet are firm. He's telling God all these things, but at the end he says, God, I say all these things, but I want you to cross-examine me to find out, to really identify, and it, for it to be known whether I really am who I say I am. Am I really solid? Is my feet really firmly planted? Is it really true? I love car warriors. And many of you have seen it, Car Ward, the two teams, and they bring in last week, I believe it was a Beetle, a little Volkswagen Beetle, and they two teams, and they got 48 hours, and we've got to modify it, make some changes. Some go traditional, some don't, and, and they're, they're totally different, 48 hours. I don't know how they do it, the pressure, 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 pressure. But at the end, then there's three judges, you know, the little guy in the middle, I like him. He really sounds like that, and he's, he was the creator of Batmobile. Anyways, they examine these cars, and they want to know, hey, they look pretty good. But he said, we're going to put them to the test. We're going to take them out on the track, and of course, they look at them, they look good, and now we're going to see if they run. And sometimes they take them out, and, and, and the, <laughs> the wheels are scraping the fenders, doesn't perform. One guy had, last week had trouble finding the gas and the brake because they mixed things up or whatever they did, but it just wasn't too functional. Put them to the test, the road test. And so David said, I want you to put me to the road test, God. I want you to cross-examine me and see if I just don't look pretty on Sunday. You know, with my hands raised and I can, I can wince. And I, you know, I think there's something in the Bible about that. But Pharisees, isn't there? Oh, you can see me. I love Jesus. And I show it with the tears. How about Monday morning? How about Tuesday? When someone cuts me off in traffic. How about when I've been done? Well, anyways, you, you get the point. I had to move on. Cross-examine me. 
You know something? David didn't stop with Psalm 26. Psalm 139, he's always wanting God to cross-examine. He says in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to mature. Testings are always going to come. You know, we always need victory in some areas. But in the process of God bringing you through to victory, at some point, sometime, there will be some, intest- some testings that God wants you to endure. We don't like them. I don't like them one little bit. Invited or not. i just amazed that David just looks, looks, says to God, here, God, test me. When's the last time you just laid before God in the altar? Test me, God! No, no, we say, no, why? But David just says, God, I, I want to know. I want to be a better person. Testings. They're headed your way. They got your number. They know your Facebook address. They, they, know, your, they know your cell phone. They know you. They'll find you. And in this account, we read that the numbers are already down to 10,000. And now there's purging, there's trying, there's testings. And my natural mind says to God, God, you better be careful because they might buckle. God, be careful because they might, you might break them. They're getting ready to face a big, big, gigantic enemy. And you're still doing this to them. It's, can they take it? A whole lot of shaking going on. Can they take it? James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials and tests of many kinds. The purest of all joys. Refined joy. Consider it refined and pure joy when you face trials and tests of many... Oh, there have been many sermons preached on that. Not if you do, but when you do. And so James tells us that you could read that and find, discover many, many... Reasons why we can consider it pure joy. Here's three that I see here. It's seasonal. Um, testings and trials and purgings and, and difficulties that come our way, it's seasonal. It will come to an end. The Bible says it will finish its work. And so you can at some point, at some time, the shaking is going to stop. The refining and the purging. And for that, you can consider it pure joy. Or as Phil says, happy, 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 happy. On Duck Dynasty, watch it. Good for you. Number two, there's produce that'll come. Just as you plant your garden this year and it comes up with nice, luscious tomatoes and beans. All those nice produce that comes up out of the earth. And James says there's some produce. We don't often think of the pro- Here's the produce, maturity. James says there's going to be completeness. There's going to be nothing lacking. There's going to be patience. There's going to be perseverance. There's going to be wisdom. There's going to be stability. So there's going to be nice, wonderful, marvelous produce that comes up out of trials and tribulations. Thirdly, James said there's a blessing, the blessing of a crown of life. This takes you, this happiness that takes you into the eternal. There's special rewards for those who hold out. Special rewards for those who hold out and hang on tight. Promised by God. And so James says that's why you can consider it pure joy. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 19, the testings of Abraham. I watched the part in the, in the movie, the Bible, when when. when Abraham took Isaac and was preparing him to give him up, to give him over, and he's packing, he's getting ready to go. That's a hard part to watch. Very, very difficult to get a visualized picture of what you read in Scripture. And we all, we know the story that just as Abraham's just ready to bring down the knife, God says, stop! The trial, the trial. Oh, what was going through Abraham's mind? All of his hopes and God's promises wrapped up in Isaac. But he obeys. And what followed Abraham's great 
trial was a great victory. God said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. You've been faithful. You've been obedient. I put you through some purging and some testings, and you came through it. I'm going to make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. I will cause your descendants to possess cities and to defeat enemies. There's victory to trials. We pick up our Bibles and we read about Job. We read chapter 1. Sometimes we get so discouraged we don't read any further. Oh, Job. Then we get into chapter 2 and we get into his lovely, lovely friends that he had. Oh, yes, they must have loved you, Job. They were such a comfort. And then we said, no, I can't take it anymore. But you got to jump. Don't ever stop with the few painful testing and trial chapters of Job, but jump to Job chapter 42 where the Bible says that God blessed Job more at the latter part of his life than the beginning. Yeah. Endure testings. Not always easy. Deep trials and tests always go before great victories. But doesn't seem to be where it fits best. But when I read about Joseph and, and Moses and Daniel and Peter and Paul, I read that they were all tried and they were twisted and they were stretched and they were squeezed. But great victories came out of those trials. What do jails and pits, lion's dens, Hunger and thirst and campfire denials in the Bible all have in common. Here's what they have in common. They were all roads and processes to great victories. They didn't make a lot of natural sense at the time. But God said, this is your pathway and this is what I want to do. This is going to bring you into an incredible triumph over the enemy. Mm. Well, the fourth thing that God said is anticipate a victory that is senseless. Judges 7 and verse 7, God says with the 300 men that lapped, I'm going to save you and give the Midianites into your hands. 135,000 of them, no small feat. But notice how God reduced the number to 300. He blew all the human stops out on this one. This was the final one. That, wow, God, it doesn't make a lot of sense at all. How you did this, but he... Take the 10,000 men down to the water. They're thirsty. Let them have a drink. And those who knelt and buried their faces in the water to drink the water were not used. So God said, tell 9,700 of them they're not needed. 9,700 left. He said the 300 that cupped the water in their hands and lapped that water up just like a, my German shepherd dog does. I watch her all the time after I exercise her. She's heading back to her caged up area, her kennel, and she's looking for the water. Puts her head in there, and she's just lapping up. But he said those that cupped the water in their hand and lap it like a dog. Those are the ones I choose. Isn't this so different? It's so different. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Those are the ones that God used. And if you were to read on in James chapter 7 and verse 19, you'd read that these 300, with these 300, they went down to the Midianite camp and they broke into this camp. They were blowing trumpets with one hand. They had a trumpet in one hand. They were blowing it. And the other hand, they were holding high, fiery, flaming torches, and they were yelling, and they were saying, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the Midianites went into panic mode. Panic mode is paralyzing mode. It wasn't just that they knew how to yell and run. and God says, I take that obedience factor, and I take that, and I bring in my power, I bring in my supernatural, and here's what happens before your eyes. Is there any doubt that I did this? No, God. 300 versus 135,000, there's no doubt. We had nothing to do with this. All we were is being obedient to you. And they were victorious. The Midianites, they turned on themselves. And they were conquerors. So here's what I 
note in conclusion, there were 300 that made it to the final round. 300 that made it to the final round. And they become an example, I believe, for you and I to follow. I want to make it to the final round in all my battles. I don't know, as well as you don't know, what battles we may have to face next week, next month, next year. No idea. But I want to make it to the final round in all the battles. I want to make it to the final round and standing on my feet with God holding my hands up and saying, Gary! You were victorious. You did what I said. And I bring you to victory lane. Oh, don't you want to make it to the final round? I want to hear the final bell sound and know that I made it through. And so God says to me and he says to you, if you want to experience a victory that is so unnatural and so uncommon, he may be saying these four things to you today first thing you have to do is make sure that you downsize the flesh. Make sure you flatten flesh. Lay it on the altar. Give it up. Give it over. Let there be no, as Paul said, glorying in the flesh. And secondly, after you downsize the flesh, why not try upsizing your faith? Upsizing your faith. And after you upsize faith, God says, now expect some trials and some tribulations and some testings and some purgings to come. And we say, yes, I'll go through that. And then God says, now anticipate a great and glorious and marvelous victory. Expect a great testimony to share to all those that need encouragement. Are you ready? Go for it. Let God do it. And I don't know where you're at this morning in your some of you may be at step one, where you're just slaying the flesh. Some of you may be at the faith point. I'm just trying to build my faith this week. I'm just trying to believe God's Word and stand upon His Word. That's great. Some of you might be at the trial stage. Oh, the trials. They kind of beat me up this past week. Well, be encouraged this morning. It's part of the process. And there may be some of you here this morning and say, boy, what a great week. I've conquered some giants this week. And I feel marvelous. The victory has come. Stand with me this morning. And the Merge Band's going to come. And they're going to sing that song that we sang earlier. It's entitled, I Am Free.